Hello, welcome to this video resource from The Connection Church, where you will experience a casual place with serious faith. We invite you to come check it out for yourself this Sunday morning. Visit our website, theconnectionchurch.org, for service times and locations. Now, get ready to hear another fun and practical message about how you can get connected to God and the people around you. All right, all right. So uh, today we are continuing God on Film, where we're looking behind the biggest blockbuster movies of the summer to discover the timeless truths found in God's Word about God's plan for our lives. And today we're going to continue by looking at the long-awaited sequel to the Pixar movie Incredibles, creatively titled Incredibles 2. What's amazing about this is even after all of these years, they hardly look like they've aged at all. You know, they look to be about the same. And, and, and in this one, as it picks up, Elastigirl gets this new job where she's working to fight to make the supers legal again. And so Bob, Mr. Incredible, he has to stay home, be super dad, taking care of his three kids, Violet, Dash, and Baby Jack Jack, who now has these superpowers. It's funny to watch Mr. Incredible with all these superpowers try to handle the regular challenges of just being a dad. You know, normal everyday life sometimes can be, uh, can be challenging, right? And, and I remember back in the first Incredibles movie that, uh, remember when Bob, he had a regular nine to five boring mundane routine job, just kind of going through the motions and I think we can all relate to feeling that way. Let's see what happens with Bob's job. Check this out. I'm not happy, Bob. Not happy. And sometimes you just feel like you're going to lose it. And many times, for many of us, we dream of, we imagine that there's more to us and there's more to life. I remember when I was a kid and I was sitting in church, uh, at the church I went to, we had this balcony. And I would sit in the balcony, and as the pastor was up there talking, I would imagine these scenarios where there was some kind of threat or some kind of danger. And I, all of a sudden, I would spring into action as a superhero flying out over the crowd to, to take care of the problem, you know? And that, that would be kind of where my imagination would go. Maybe you've imagined yourself as a superhero with superpowers, or maybe you've just imagined yourself at some other greater uh, job. But, you know, for, for most of us, having an incredible life is not going to come with having some kind of superpower or even a job change. It, it's, it's all about knowing that you, your life mattered, that your life meant something, and, and you're able to do something with impact and significance in your life. So today, I want us to look at another incredible team of heroes known in the Bible as the disciples of Jesus. And what's so amazing about the disciples of Jesus is that they really had no idea what they were getting into when Jesus extended this invitation to them to follow him. They just simply knew that Jesus was asking them to go, and they were able to changed the world, and they were able to have great impact with their lives simply because they responded to that invitation. And if I were to be able to sit down with you personally and ask you, do you want to have an incredible life? I know for sure that your answer would be yes, without a doubt. I want my life to be incredible. So I want to paint a picture today of an incredible life as we look at the disciples really from Matthew chapter 4 to Matthew chapter 10, where it starts out in Matthew 4, Jesus calls some fishermen to be his followers. And he says, I want you to trade your business for my business. And Matthew 4, 18, it says, One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, 
come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets, and he called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. And what jumps out to me in this passage here is that when Jesus called, they immediately and at once followed him. They, they did it just quickly. There was something so compelling about Jesus. And you might say, well, you know what? They were fishermen. And if my job was fishing for a living and Jesus called me, I'd follow him too. I mean, Jesus could have said to me, he could have said, follow me and I'll kick you in the head every day. And I would have said, yeah, that sounds good. I'll follow you. Because, you know, who wants to get those hooks caught in your fingers all the time? And who wants to walk around smelling like fish all the time? We don't know why the disciples chose to follow after Jesus, but they did. And as they did, they started to discover more about who Jesus was and what his plan is for the world. And so then in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, teaching in the synagogues, preaching everywhere the good news about the kingdom. And as he was going everywhere, in verse 25, it says, large crowds followed him wherever he went. Something you're going to notice in the Gospels, every time you look at Jesus is, wherever he was, there were these large crowds. People were attracted to Jesus. They loved being around Jesus. And I think the more we're like Jesus, the more people want to be here at the Connection Church. The more we lift up Jesus, the more people are drawn to him. And then in Matthew chapter 5, this is where Jesus starts preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and he's teaching the Beatitudes, and the disciples get to hear all of this, and they're learning. They're learning more about God's plan, and, and pretty soon the, the learners are becoming the teachers, because with all the crowds that were always around Jesus, you know there were some people that wanted to talk to Jesus, but they couldn't get close enough to him, so they have to talk to the disciples, right? And I can imagine somebody coming up to Peter, for example, and just saying, hey, you know, I heard Jesus said that thing about love your enemies. Did he really mean that? Peter goes, hmm, well, that's kind of weird, isn't it? I guess so, yeah, I think he really meant that. And um, they were just learning so much, and they were seeing so much action and so much happen, and they were seeing lives changed, and they were seeing sick people healed. They were seeing all this exciting stuff happening. It must have been so exciting for these disciples of Jesus. They were uh, nobodies, no name, fishermen, and now they went from that to working security for God in a bod for Jesus. And so it must have been very exciting, but they were also finding the longer they followed after Jesus, the harder it was getting. That it wasn't always exciting. Sometimes it was scary, and sometimes it was uncomfortable, and sometimes it was dangerous. And the more they followed Jesus, the more they realized that this was going to be hard. In Matthew chapter 8, it says that all the disciples and Jesus were out on this boat when this incredible storm comes up. And they were professional fishermen, but they were afraid for their lives. And so they go down and they wake up Jesus. They're like, Jesus, save us. Save us. There's this huge storm. And he gets up and he says, what are you so afraid of? There's this huge storm. We're, we're going to die. And Jesus looks out over the waves. He says, you have little faith. And he looks at the waves. He says, peace, be still. And the waves calm and the storm stills and the disciples are in awe and they're like, wow, who is this? And then right after that, it talks about how Jesus is, um, is healing this man who is, um, he's casting out demons from, from this guy. And, and that must have been a pretty scary situation too, dealing with demon-possessed people. And so, you know, there, there was all kinds of scary situations. And then in Matthew 9, Jesus, he uh, meets this guy named Matthew, who's a tax collector. And Jesus says, follow me. He gives him the same invitation. Now, back in that time, 
People didn't like tax collectors very much. It was very different than the way we feel about tax collectors today, right? They were hated back then. And so, so Matthew, he responds to this invitation from Jesus, and he throws his party at his house. He invites Jesus and the disciples and his tax collector friends, and it says, and other notorious sinners, and all these people are over at Matthew's house, and so the religious leaders of the day are looking at Jesus and being around all these sinners, and they say to the disciples, they say, why does your teacher eat with such scum? So they were facing persecution. They were facing criticism. They were facing even deadly, dangerous situations, but they stuck with Jesus no matter what, through everything they were going through. And then in Matthew 10, Jesus raises the bar, and he says, you've been watching me do all this. Now it's time for you to get in the game. Now you're going to be doing the things that I've been doing. See, having an incredible life isn't about sitting and soaking. It's about serving. So in Matthew chapter 10, it says, Jesus called 12 of his followers and sent them into the ripe fields. He gave them the power to kick out the evil spirits and to tenderly care for the bruised and hurt lives. Jesus sent his 12 harvest hands out with this charge. Go to the lost. Tell them that the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. Touch the untouchables. You've been treated generously, so live generously. You have been given so much, so you're gonna live that way You're going to go out and do all of these things. You're going to go to the lost. You're going to bring health to the sick. You're going to touch the untouchables. And in Matthew 10, 41, Jesus says, this is a large work I've called you to, but don't be overwhelmed by it. It's best to start small. And then he tells them what small looks like. He says, if you give even a cup of cold water to even the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. He says, you're going to do all this dangerous stuff. You're going to do all this hard stuff, but there is a big payoff. You will be rewarded for this. And that's how you have an incredible life. You know, I used to dream about being a rock star. I used to dream about being a superhero. Now, my dream is to be a faithful follower of Jesus and to do life following after him as he leads with other people on the journey together that we're walking together, being the hands and feet of Jesus. And even as we face those hard, challenging times together, knowing that there is a great reward in store for those of us who stay on the path and stay faithful following after him. And that is an incredible life. And I know everybody wants to have an incredible life, but we get confused about what does an incredible life look like. We think an incredible life means having a nice house, having a nice car, you know, having a, having a good job, or even beyond having a good job, being able to retire early from our job and kicking back and living the easy life, right? That's what we think a, an incredible life is. And, and yet, why is it that People who have all of this stuff get to the end of their life and look back on their life and say, my life was not incredible. It wasn't meaningful. It didn't make a difference. Because having an incredible life isn't about who has the most stuff. It's about making the greatest impact with your life. The disciples got it. So how do we get it? I want us to look at what these disciples did so that we can do what they did to move our lives from being ordinary to being incredible. And the first thing we've got to do is to trade convenience for obedience. This is the hardest thing to do. You think about the disciples in their lives. Their lives, they, I, I'm not saying they had a, an easy life, but it was pretty convenient. It was pretty predictable. It was routine, ordinary, the same thing each and every day. And Jesus messed up their idea of of convenient when he called to them and said, follow me. And the disciples replaced convenience with obedience. We love convenience. We have convenience marketed to us 
all the time. I remember back in the day, if you wanted to watch a movie, you know, there was pretty much one option. You would, you would go to the theater and watch this movie at the theater, and I still love doing that today, but, uh, but then, you know, at some point, I remember getting cable and getting HBO and Showtime, and now all of a sudden, we were getting to watch these movies in our house, and then we had VCRs and VHS tapes, and how many of you remember making it a blockbuster night, right? And you'd go to the blockbuster video store and walk up and down the aisles, and part of the fun was in finding those movies and Be Kind Rewind and, you know, all of that that went along with it. Then they started, they had a mail order service, right? You could order them and they'd send them to you in the mail and you'd send them back. And then we started streaming with Netflix and Hulu and everything streaming on our TVs. And now in our pockets, we can watch almost any movie we can imagine right now, anytime. I wonder what's next in terms of convenience. Maybe they could just download the movie directly into our brains, right? So you just, whoop, and you've got it. There it is. That's convenient. We love convenience, but many times convenience is diametrically opposed to a life of obedience. When Jesus called the disciples to follow him, he wasn't saying, hey, Come with me, follow me, and we'll frolic through the fields, and we'll just walk slowly, stop and smell the olive trees. We'll, we'll uh, talk theology and drink coffee. And, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't saying that. He, he, was, he was saying something very different. And for, for us, we got to understand it's not about convenience. Sometimes it's very inconvenient to follow after Jesus, to do the hard thing. I, as I've studied the Bible for many, many years, I've never found a promise of convenience in the Bible. In fact, if you choose to follow Jesus, many times it's going to be just the opposite of convenient. Many times it's going to be hard. In fact, if you follow Jesus, you can expect your life to be ruined. You say, <laughs> great, that sounds like a great marketing slogan for the church, you know. <laughs> Come to the Connection Church, expect your life to be ruined. We can put it on the billboard on 35, you know. I'm sure that would be very effective at keeping people away, right? No, but when I say expect your life to be ruined, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean expect your life to be gloriously ruined. My life has been ruined by Jesus Christ because he has completely changed the way that I look at life and the way that I look at relationships, the way I look at injustice and pain and suffering in our world, it's changed. He has changed every way that I would look at life. Maybe you've been on this journey for a while and a lot of times Christians, after after they've been Christians for a long time, they start using this language. They start saying, um, they start saying, oh, I just want to go deeper. I just want to go deeper in my walk. What is deep? What is deep? You know, what I've found is, is uh, many times Christians, they don't really want deeper. They want the illusion of deeper. They say, they say, Deeper would be like, oh, Pastor Cole, why don't you just like preach on one verse of the Bible for eight weeks? That would be really deep. And if you could just maybe throw in a little more Greek words as you preach, that would be really deep. Or maybe if you weren't so funny when you preach, that would be really deep. But God says, if you want to go deeper, deeper is defined as obedience. That is what is truly deeper. That's as deep as it gets. God is always challenging us in the Bible to a life of obedience. In Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus replied, but even more blessed are all who hear the word of God and put it into practice. See, most Christians are educated far beyond their level of obedience. We don't necessarily even need to, I'm not saying, well, I'm gonna finish. I'll finish my sentence. I was gonna say, we don't necessarily need to hear another sermon we just need to put into practice the sermons we've heard, okay? Now, come next week. I got another sermon for you. <laughs> but put this one into practice. John 14, 15, if you love me, obey my commandments, Jesus said. 1 John 5, 3, 
Loving God means keeping his commandments. In Romans 2.13, merely hearing God's laws are a waste of time if you don't do what he commands. Doing, not hearing, is what makes the difference with God. It's not about hearing and going different places and hearing and hearing. It's about going different places and doing and serving and making a difference with your life. To have an incredible life, you've got to do it God's way. And many times, that means it's not going to be convenient for you. Sprite says, obey your thirst. That's what our world will tell you. Our world will say, obey your cravings, obey your appetites, obey your emotions, obey your impulses, obey your feelings. And God says, obey his word, obey his commandments. And when you do, he gives you the promise that you will have an incredible life. And as you do, replace convenience with obedience. Do it afraid. Do it afraid. Put yourself out there in scary situations and take risks. Jesus was always putting his disciples in these scary, risky situations, and they were growing because scary situations produce spiritual growth in your life. In Matthew 10, 6, what did he say? He said, go to the lost, confused people right here in the neighborhood. Tell them the kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. Raise the dead. Touch the untouchables. Kick out the demons. You've been treated generously. Live generously. What does he say to do? Some scary things. He says, go to the lost. And you might say, well, I'm not going to go to the lost. (laughs) There's some scary people out there. There's atheists out there. There's terrorists out there. All kinds of other ists out there. There's there's, uh, people who think differently and act differently and believe differently. I'm not going to go to those people. You go to those people. You're the pastor. Listen, you may not be a preacher, but you have been gifted by God to be a listener. And you can listen to people. You have a story to share about what God has done in your life. We get confused about what it means to go to the lost. We think going to the lost means getting up in people's faces and beating them over the head with a Bible. That's not what it's about. People want to have meaningful conversations, even spiritual conversations. You see, everybody's got a story. And when you stop and you listen to somebody's story, you'll begin to hear and see how God has been at work in their life. And you've got a story to tell about what God has done in your life. And you know enough about God's story to be able to shed some light on God's story for them. And where their story and your story and God's story meet, that's the point where lives are changed. Right there. And and it could just be that you extend an invitation to come to the Connection Church. To say, hey, come. You'll be very welcome. God God is doing some things and, and And you should come check it out. I'd love to see you next Sunday. You can do that. But I want to issue you a challenge this week, some homework, to put yourself out there in a scary situation and just ask a question and listen. Just ask a question. Say, hey, tell me a little bit about your story and listen for opportunities. Hey, what what do you believe in? Ask that question. You know, you're not getting in somebody's face and trying to tell them anything. You're trying to listen to people's story. That's going to the lost. And another scary situation is bringing health to the sick. I'm not talking about performing surgery or administering medicine, anything like that. Most of us can't do that. What I'm saying is putting, putting yourself out there for somebody maybe who is hurting emotionally, somebody who's going through some kind of struggle in their life. We can care for each other in our church family. We can care for people outside of our church family. I'm talking about obeying God in the small stuff and doing those small things. Maybe it's going over and mowing the yard for somebody who who is not able to do that right now for some reason. Maybe it's taking food to somebody you know who is sick or somebody who's just, you know, had a had a baby or or had some some event happen, had a loss in their life, something like that. Or maybe it's just spending time with somebody who's lonely. What's a scary situation that you could put yourself in 
this week to be used by God. And then a third situation is, is to touch the untouchables. When Jesus said touch the untouchables, in that time, he was mainly talking about people with the deadly, devastating disease of leprosy. And leprosy was very contagious, and it would literally cause your body parts to fall off. That's a scary situation. But we have some untouchables today in our community, in our culture, some people that, that other people look down on, that other people want to look away, you know, people who maybe they don't have or they, they uh, believe different or they act different. And a lot of times in churches, we don't want to even acknowledge that. We don't even want to deal with it because we're afraid it's going to tarnish or stain our reputation. And it's time for us as a church to be willing to put our reputation on the line and be willing to touch the untouchables and love those who seem to be unlovable and get our hands dirty. Why aren't we doing these hard things? You know why? It's really one word, usually. It's fear. Fear keeps us back. We're afraid. So you gotta put yourself, how do you, how do you get over your fear? You put yourself in scary situations, right? And I'll tell you, it's scary being the pastor of the Connection Church. That's scary. It would be much more convenient for my life if I could go be the pastor of some respectable, nice little uh, painted white church with a big steeple on top of it and get to just go to church with a bunch of people who've been in church all their life and just kind of teach the Bible. That would be... That would be much more convenient and simple for my life. But it's scary being the pastor of the Connection Church where we exist for the sake of those who aren't here yet, for people who, who don't know Jesus, and, and where we are willing to reach out and get our hands dirty. And, and last week, we were able to s- baptize 18 people. 18 people went public with their faith in Jesus. And we... We continue to see people step across that line as we create this environment where people are welcome, a come-as-you-are culture. And we believe, and I believe, that we are on the verge of a great move of God, and we're not going to just go through the motions. We're not just going to play church, okay? We're going to continue to do some risky things, some scary things, some things that other people, they may look down on. They may say, you know, can you do that or should you do that at church? But we're going to make a difference, and we're going to believe that God is going to use us to make a difference, not only in our community, in our county, but in our world. And as we do these things and we do them afraid, we're going to believe that we can make a difference. And you can believe you can make a difference because you know the disciples, what set them apart was that they believed so much that God wanted to use their life to make a difference that they literally, many of them, most of them gave their lives. They died for what they believed in. And I wonder, do you believe God can use your life and God wants to use your life? So many of us, we say, well, no, my past is too messed up. My past is too messed up. I'm not skilled enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not an incredible person. I'm just an ordinary person. Can I tell you something, ordinary person? God loves to use ordinary people to do incredible things. God wants to use your life to do something incredible. The Bible is full of example after example of backwards, uneducated, messed up people who were used by God to do incredible things simply because they trusted God for something bigger and something more. You know, it blows me away that God could use me. Honestly, as your pastor, it blows me away that God could use my life because I know me and I know the condition of my heart and I know that many times it is messed up and sick and dark and twisted. You're like, wow. Pastor Cole, are you even worthy to be our pastor? Well, I also know something about you. I don't want to step on any toes, but I know the condition of your heart too. (laughs) And I know it's dark, and maybe not you, but most of you. Dark and twisted and 
sick and messed up. Thankfully, God chooses to use us. You know the difference between a difference maker and somebody who just simply goes through their life and takes up space? It's that they, a difference maker, believes that God can use their life to make a difference. That's simply it. And that doesn't mean that it's not going to be scary. That's not, that doesn't mean you're not going to be afraid. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have doubts. It means that in spite of your doubts, you're choosing to believe God for more. God wants to use your life to make a difference. You know what Jesus told the disciples as he sent them out in Matthew 10.10? 10? He said, you don't need a lot of equipment. You are the equipment. I've given you everything you need to make a difference. The disciples knew. They knew they didn't have what it takes. They knew that they weren't incredible on their own. They knew that they weren't skilled and talented and gifted enough on their own, but they knew that if they stayed connected with Jesus, that he would use them to make a great difference and an eternal difference. And that's what they did. And that's what God wants to do in your life. That's what he wants to do through your life. He wants you to have an incredible life but we've got to start by exchanging our idea of what an incredible life is for God's idea of an incredible life. And remember, God's benefit plan is out of this world, okay, both for now and for eternity. So we just simply say, God, use my life in an incredible way. I'm going to choose obedience. I'm going to do it afraid. And I'm going to believe you for big things. Let's stand together and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you in this place, God. Thank you that you would choose to use us, God, that you would choose to, to uh, work through us. God, that our decision, our choice is to stay close to you, to follow you, to obey you, even when it's hard, even when it doesn't make sense, even, even when it's difficult, God, to put ourselves out there in those scary situations, God, because we know that's where we're gonna grow in great ways. God, help us, lead us to those this week that we can go to. Go to the hurting, go to the lost, go to the confused, go to the broken, messed up people like we are many times. God, but we're walking with you and in you. Give us your spirit's power. For those of you today who would say, I wanna accept Jesus' invitation to follow after him. I've never taken that step to give him my heart and my life. Would you pray a prayer simply like this? in this place, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I need you in my heart and my life. Thank you for giving your life for me. Today I want to give you my life. I want to follow after you, obeying you. Make me part of your forever family. Fill me with your spirit. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, all right. Hello and welcome to The Connection Church. We're so glad you're here with us today and here's some ways that you can get connected. Join TCC and the City of Buda for Movies in the Park at Buda City Sportsplex on Friday, July 27th at 8 p.m. to watch Star Wars The Last Jedi. Wear a Connection t-shirt if you have one so we can have a great time together and connect with people in our community. For info on how you can help, email bobby at theconnectionchurch.org. Teamwork makes the dream work. Come see what serving on the Dream Team is all about at this year's Dream Team Rally on Saturday, August 4th from 10 to 11.30 a.m. Whether you're already serving on a ministry team or you want to find out how, you don't want to miss this life-changing rally as we prepare for a great fall. For more questions or to RSVP, email info at theconnectionchurch.org. We're partnering with Hope and Love for Kids and Greater San Marcos Youth Council to collect supplies so every kid in Hayes County can successfully start the new school year. Pick up a supplies list at Info Central in the lobby and bring your donations by Sunday, August 12th. If this is your first time with us, you're our VIP. So text the word WELCOME to 512-359-3400 and visit the red carpet area to receive a free gift just for you. We hope you enjoyed this video resource from The Connection Church, and we want to get connected with you. Visit theconnectionchurch.org for more information.